You think there's a real Jesus? Mm-hmm. Definitely? Absolutely. A thousand percent. What makes you convinced? My faith. A lot of people think that Christianity is just faith, not fact. But a lot of people believe a lot of different things. And when your eternity rests on this, whether Jesus lived, died and rose again, can we have more than just wanting to believe it to rest on? Well, the good news is we can. So in this video, we're going to see the late Christian apologist Nabil Qureshi give complete historical fact and evidence to show us why we can believe that Jesus did live, die and rise again. So let's dive in. Some of you might be even asking, Nabil, why should I even believe Jesus is real? Why should I ever even believe that he's a man who existed? The first thing I'm going to start off by telling you is that it is incontrovertible according to the historical principles of investigation that a man named Jesus existed in the first century. How do we know this? We have over 40 records of Jesus' life from ancient times describing this man who is essentially a carpenter in Palestine. He didn't have much of anything. He wasn't a centrally important figure at the time, yet we have 40 sources that refer to him. You know who the emperor was at Jesus' time? Someone shout it out. Tiberius. Good. Tiberius was the emperor of Rome at that time. Now, this is a man who obviously we should have a lot written about. We can expect tons and tons of records about this man, can't we? The historical records contain Tiberius' name by 10 different individuals. That's it. 10 for Tiberius, the emperor of Rome, 40 for Jesus. You can see we have excellent reason to believe that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, lived and existed in the first century. And that's why very, very few, in fact, I could probably count it on one hand, actually, just, I know of two, scholars who study the historical Jesus actually claim that Jesus never existed. And one of them is Bob Price, who most other scholars say is just not, not even possible what he says. So we can dismiss just due to the reasoning and due to the lack of scholastic support that this is actually the case. So Jesus certainly exists. Okay, what can we know about him? Well, of the scholars that study him, and keep in mind, there is an entire uh, area of historical studies called historical Jesus studies. So we have scholars who've been studying this on all sides. These aren't all Christians by any means. Actually, the most influential ones wouldn't, allow, wouldn't align themselves with Orthodox Christianity. You have people like Paula Fredrickson, Marcus Borg, Bart Ehrman. You have people along these lines who would say, like John Dominic Crossan, who would say that of Jesus we can know for a fact that he died on the cross. Now keep in mind, that's one of our three points that we're proving for Christianity or attempting to show to determine its reliability. Did Jesus die on the cross? The scholars who study his life, regardless of whether they're atheist, Buddhist, agnostic, Hindu, Christian, it doesn't matter. They all conclude that Jesus died on the cross. Now, if I left it there, it would be an appeal to authority, and we're trying to be academically rigorous tonight, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you some of their reasons why they believe Jesus died on the cross, but we're going to keep it brief because scholars are unanimous on this issue. By the way, it's not just them. Even Muslim scholars will argue that Jesus did die on the cross. How many of you heard of Reza Aslan's book recently, Zealots, that came out this, this year? A few of you? Reza Aslan's a, uh, a, a scholar who has studied the historical Jesus. And as a Muslim, he says, yes, Islam denies Jesus' death on the cross. And I am a Muslim, but I confirm that Jesus' death on the cross is historically certain. In fact, he builds his whole book off the fact that Jesus died on the cross. So even as a Muslim, he says Jesus died on the cross. So why? Why do they say this? Well, because first off, all the evidence that we have, all the records of Jesus' life, which talk about his death, indicate that he did die. If they say anything, it says that he did die on the cross under Pontius Pilate, which is why Paula Fredrickson says, if there's anything we can know about Jesus, anything at all, it's this, that he died on the cross under Pontius Pilate. If you go away from Christian records, you go to uh, Jewish records like Josephus, we can also see in the first century that non-Christians are saying Jesus died on the cross. We go to Gentile scholars, they are also agreeing that Jesus died on the cross. And in fact, we also have some of them saying that these people believe he has risen from the dead. We'll get to that in just a moment. So we have excellent reason to believe Jesus died on the cross because all the records point to that. Plus, if you study the historical process of crucifixion, nobody ever in the, heri in the, in the entire history of, of the Roman process of crucifixion, no one ever survived a full Roman crucifixion. 
Oh, they were crucifying people by the hundreds, especially when it came time around Jesus' time, all the way till the fall of the temple. They were crucifying people by the hundreds to make a point. That if you rebel against the Romans, we will humiliate you, we will torture you, and we will destroy you and your people. And that's exactly what was happening to all the Jews who were amongst this rebellion that happened in the late 60s, beginning of the 70s, uh, in the first century AD. Not a single one of them survived the process of crucifixion. Why? Well, first there's a flogging process. And this flogging isn't light. It's not like caning. The flogging process went uh, with a Roman flagrum. Now, if you understand what a flagrum is, it's a whip that has six leather cords that come off of it. And each of those leather cords has leather balls at the end with shards of bone and metal dumbbells. As a person would be whipped, this whip was designed to cause extreme vasodilation on the skin. You have those metal dumbbells there for that reason, to bring the blood vessels, uh, to, to bring lots of blood to the fore, to bring pain receptors to the surface. And then those bones, those shards of bones would latch into the skin and rip it off. So you would bleed more blood than you otherwise would. That's how this whip was designed. Oh, this whole process of crucifixion was designed to be as painful, as torturous as possible. Cicero, I believe it was Cicero who said that let no Roman citizen even think or hear the word crucifixion. And Roman citizens were not allowed to be crucified. This was reserved for the most treacherous criminals. Not a common criminal, the worst criminal. It was also said that arteries and veins were laid bare during the process of the crucifixion. Uh, I'm sorry, of the flogging. That people's intestines often fell out because their abdominal wall was ripped open. This was horrific, and people often died during the flogging process. It's called the pre-death for that very reason. And in the case of Jesus, we know that something happened. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus was flogged more than normal because Pilate wanted to bring, bring Jesus back in front of the crowd and say, look, we've flogged him. Do you still want to crucify him? We've punished him. And they say, no, crucify him. It, it would stand to reason that he flogged him more than they thought they would in order for him to say, okay, let's go ahead and release him. But they said, no, let's, let's crucify him. Let's move on for just a moment. This process of flogging would often leave someone devoid of skin. Their skin would be falling off in ribbons. As they're carrying the cross, they're not carrying it with a loincloth on, with skin on their body. No, their skin's hanging off in tatters. And they're naked, made to parade through a group of people. And once they're finally nailed on the cross, the cro they're nailed through uh, the interosseous space here between the radius and the ulna. It's because that is where the, the force of the weight could be held. If someone was nailed through the hands, the hands would just rip and someone would, would die that way. The reason why it says hands in some places is because in those times they referred to this old, whole area as hands. They're nailed through here, right through the median nerve the major sensory motor nerve of the hand, if you are nailed through that place, you immediately lose all use and sensation of your hand. Then you're nailed through your feet. A seven-inch nail goes through both your feet. Why? Because if someone were just to hang on the cross, they would have no way to breathe out. As they sink back down, they'd breathe in, and they'd have to push to breathe out. Well, what are they going to push against? A nail through their feet. It's to prolong the torture. It's to prolong the death. And when they finally wanted to kill you, they'd break your knees so that you couldn't push up anymore and you'd asphyxiate and die. Or they would stick a spear through your heart. That was a way to be sure that you'd be dead. Or they'd crush your skull with a hammer. Or they'd light your body on fire. Or they'd take your body and feed you to dogs. They were going to make absolutely sure that you died. That was the whole point. And no one in all of Roman history survived a full crucifixion. So we have excellent reason to believe Jesus died on the cross. Did he rise from the dead? This is an important matter. And lots of historians say we cannot investigate the resurrection because that's not a historical matter. That's a supernatural matter. And you can't study supernatural matters. Well, that's jumping the gun just a bit. If every explanation that is naturalistic falls short and falls very short, of explaining what happened, then we have reason to believe that something supernatural may have happened. If there simply is no good explanation, naturalistically speaking, we can use a historical process of investigation to conclude that quite likely maybe something supernatural happened here. 
So what happened when Jesus died? Shortly after his death, we take a look at what happened. And those historical scholars we've already referred to, in general, agree with three facts that are considered relatively incontrovertible. And I'm giving you what's called the minimal facts argument, if you want to look into this. It's called the minimal facts argument, primarily uh, promoted by a man named Gary Habermas, who's written a book called The Historical Jesus. Also by his protege, Michael Lacona, who's written a book called The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. He wrote it alongside Gary Habermas. And he's also written his manifesto, a rather large book um, that serves well for curing insomnia. Um, he's written that as well. Sorry, Mike. He's written that as well. Um, and if you want to look at a very thorough investigation of the historical method on whether or not Jesus died, I suggest you take a look at this book published by Erdman's. Michael Lacona is the author. The argument runs as follows. Pretty much all, every scholar who studies this, at least a vast majority, if not virtually all scholars, conclude three things happened after Jesus died. Well, number one, the first one is that Jesus did die on the cross, which we just looked at. Number two, that the disciples, Jesus' disciples, all believed he had risen from the dead. Now, get me, get me right here. That doesn't mean he did just because they believed it. But it means they did sincerely believe it. They went to their death believing Jesus died and rose and appeared to them. So it's that belief that we're holding on to. Not necessarily that he did, but they sincerely believed he had risen from the dead. And why do they conclude that, by the way? All the, uh, all the disciples ran away from Jesus when he was arrested. They were fearful. They didn't know what was going on. Even Thomas, who was willing to go to his death for Jesus, when Jesus was arrested, they all ran away. Of course, we know John watched the watch the crucifixion, and we do know that Peter came to the trial scene, but at least at that time, they all ran away. However, after the resurrection, these men were willing to go to their deaths proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. These men were willing to die for the fact that this man had risen. Again, that doesn't mean he had actually risen, that we're not there yet, but it does mean they sincerely believed it, because liars make poor martyrs. People aren't going to die for a lie or something that they know is false. Of course, people die for things that are false all the time, but not things that they know are false. So, the disciples truly believed that Jesus had risen from the dead, and according to most historical Jesus scholarship, Christianity wouldn't have gotten off the ground if it weren't for that fact. Fact number three. Fact number one was Jesus died on the cross. Fact number two, the disciples truly believed he had risen from the dead. Fact number three, People who were enemies of Jesus, or not his disciples, also believed he had risen from the dead. Now, who are we talking about? We're talking specifically about two people. James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, as it were. James, the brother of Jesus, did not follow Jesus during his lifetime. We see in the book of Mark that Jesus' family comes up and says to people around Jesus that he is out of his mind, basically, that he's crazy, which is what leads Jesus to say, who is my mother and brother and sister? It's those who do the will of God. So Jesus' family is not on his side. It wasn't until after the resurrection or supposedly the resurrection when all of a sudden the disciple James becomes a, I'm sorry, the brother of Jesus James because becomes a leader of the Christian church. And also Saul of Tarsus. Who is this Saul guy? Saul was the student of Gamaliel, one of the chief leaders of the Jews in the time. This man was primed and groomed to be a leader of Jews, a leader of Pharisees. He was going to have all kinds of power in the temple. He already had all kinds of power because he was able to deliver people to prison. He was given special permission to hunt Christians down. Yet this man was willing to go to his death over and over and over again for something. For what? He claims it was because he has seen the risen Jesus. This is huge because it means that if Jesus actually did live, and die on the cross just as he said he would in the gospels the reason that he died matters now from a historical point of view jesus died because the jews couldn't handle him he pointed out their hypocrisy their lies and exposed that their hearts were far from god but what about the spiritual reason that jesus died the theological reason that jesus died john the baptist the guy who was there to prepare the way for jesus says about christ he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, if you know anything about Old Testament Israel, God gave them a sacrificial system because they constantly sinned and sinned and sinned. And the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die because of our sins. But God gave the Israelites a system to show their faith and repentance in God to offer sacrifices. Why? 
because the wages of sin is death. But the sacrifice was a substitute for the Israelites. But we know that the blood of lambs and goats cannot take away anybody's sins, cannot cleanse us from sins. It's in the eyes of God. It's not enough to make us righteous in his eyes. But it was a shadow. It was a picture of the ultimate sacrifice that God would give himself, that Jesus himself would be the sacrifice for our sins. So he is God, fully God, who then takes on flesh and becomes fully man. Why? The fact that he's God means he can bring us to God. The fact that he's man means that he can stand in our place in his death. So when Jesus died on that cross, he wasn't just dying because the Jews hated him. He was dying to take the punishment for our sins. And 1 John 2, 2 says he is the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is something that satisfies wrath. He satisfies God's anger at our sins. And not just the, the Jews, for anyone who believes, for the whole world, not just the, the Jews. The Messiah is no longer just for Israel, but the Messiah is for all people, all people groups. And just beforehand, we see that when we do sin, we don't need to have fear. Why? Because Jesus Christ now sits at the right hand of the Father, advocating on our behalf. What does that mean? That means that when the devil stands in front of God and accuses me and says, God, you see that guy? See that guy, Emmanuel? He's a sinner. He's a sinner. Jesus stands in, in my place and says, yeah, he is, but he's covered by my blood. Yes, he has sinned, but he's mine. He's my advocate. And this is why the literal resurrection matters. The literal life, death, burial and resurrection and ascension into heaven of Jesus matters. It's not good enough just to see him as a little symbol. Because I need to know that when I stand in front of God, when, my, when I close my eyes and I never wake up again, I need to know what's going to happen. I need to know whether my sins are forgiven. And because I know that Jesus Christ died, but because I know that Jesus Christ lives, I have assurance that I will be with him. And you can have that same assurance that your sins are washed clean and your sins are forgiven by the blood of of the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, if you believe. And this is not blind faith. This is a faith based on reason, based on history, and a faith made possible because of the gracious love of God. I hope this video has blessed you. If you want to see another one, check here. I'll see you in the next video. Peace and blessings.